Hello, today is June 23rd, 2015. We're meeting today with Mr. Kent Cowell at his home in Loveland, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Kent, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Thanks, Brad. Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Uh, I was born here in Colorado in 1948, June 1948. I just had a birthday, and, and uh, my mom and dad divorced when I was three, so mom moved back to Nebraska, where she was from, and took us kids with her. had a brother and uh, John, and uh, the two of us uh, with mom moved to DeWitt, Nebraska, a small town of 500 in southeast Nebraska. And uh, that's where vice grips were invented and made, Peterson's manufacturer. And uh, uh, mom had to further her education, so I lived with uh, grandma and grandpa for about four or five years. And uh, good years. Now, that's my first memories, really, uh, even though I was born in Fort Collins. Uh, my first memories are of DeWitt, and uh, they were good years. And grew up, uh, eventually moved to Lincoln, and uh, went to high school in Lincoln, graduated in 1966. Uh, entered the University of uh, Nebraska. Uh, I was only there a year and a half. I didn't do well. I, I, I uh, partied too much and uh, eventually uh, saw the writing on the wall and I enlisted in the Army. Now why did, uh, uh, of all the service branches, how, how did you come to choose the Army then? I'm not sure. I just, it, I just pulled me and uh, I thought, I just thought that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the, the service that counts. I don't know why. Mm. I just did. So I saw an army recruiter. I asked him uh, if I could be a helicopter pilot. And he said, no, your eyes aren't good enough. He said, they have 30 tests for eyes. You wouldn't get past the first one. So I said, uh, well, how about uh, jumping out of, out of planes? Could I be a paratrooper? And he said, no, they have eye tests too. So I said, well, I guess I, guess I don't want to be in the army. So I, I started to leave and he said, no, wait, wait. <laughs> so he drew me in and Eventually, I, I did become a paratrooper. So. Oh wow! Oh, very cool. How much longer then after you after you uh, enlisted did you take off for for? Uh, it wasn't basic long. Went through the uh, normal physicals and uh, uh, left from Omaha by plane. Went through Minneapolis, St. Paul to Fort Lewis, Washington, where I took basic and uh, advanced individual training in infantry. And uh, that's the only. That's the only post, at that time, it was the only post that issues wet weather gear for standard equipment. So there was a lot of rain, but it was fun. It and, was a, and how was that transition from civilian life into to military life? For uh, you? Completely different. I mean, it was, uh, I had freedom and then all of a sudden I don't. But I liked the discipline. It was good for me. I think that was, uh, I think that was a good part of my life. And I didn't dislike uh, the training. The training was good, too. Okay. And then from from basic, where'd you where'd you go from? Uh, AIT was right there in Fort Lewis, also, and then uh, then uh, I volunteered for jump school right at the end of AIT. Uh, everybody in my AIT went straight to Vietnam, except for three of us, and we went to jump school in Fort Benning. Uh, three weeks of jump school, which was intense. We ran everywhere. We this was in like the middle of summer too. It was uh, oh, it was hot, and uh, they ran us through uh, outdoor showers to keep us cool. And uh, after three weeks of that, uh, uh, we graduated from uh, uh, jump school, and I was assigned to the 82nd Airborne at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. You remember that first jump? From, uh, the first jump was excellent. I, uh, that first jump was, uh, there was no problem at all. Uh, get to the door and jump out, and uh, you're exhilarated, and you hit the ground, of course. You're not going to go anywhere else. And, <laughs> and uh, it wasn't bad at all. The fourth jump, I, I hurt my leg a little oh. bit, but I, you know, it was not that bad, and I survived. And uh, the next day, I made my last jump for the day, and and then uh, after Vietnam, I actually went back to jump status because I worked for the Rangers uh, in Florida Ranger Camp, and uh, my final jump was Friday the 13th in the middle of the night, and I landed in the trees. And, and I said, that's it, I'm done. So, 13 jumps, wow. Friday the 13th. <laughs> yeah, right. Wow. So you're in the 82nd. Uh, take your story from there, then. 82nd, I was there almost a year. And uh, I enjoyed that. North Carolina is a neat state. Uh, good times, bad times, just normal uh, active duty stuff stateside. stateside. And then uh, uh, 
I got orders for Vietnam after almost a year there. And uh, I think I had a 30-day leave before leaving for Vietnam. And a tough day was when you finally leave. Yeah, I remember yeah. uh, in, uh, in Nebraska, the drinking age was 20. And, uh, or 21, 21. And I was 20, so I couldn't have a drink legally. <laughs> and uh, when I left, the day I left for Vietnam was the day the law changed to 20. So when we got to the airport in the morning, early in the morning, I said, i got to have a drink because it's legal. So I had a Bloody Mary or something like that before I, the plane left. And, but it was a tough day because I remember walking out to the plane. I couldn't look back. Oh, if I had looked back, I wouldn't have gone. Yeah, so right. I yeah. just kept on walking. How was it? I mean, up to that point, I mean, you were stateside. Had had uh, the protests and all that stuff flared up here yet? Uh, yeah, there were protests, but uh, I don't think they were to the degree they were when I when I got oh, back. Okay. Yeah. I think that that was nineteen, uh, uh, and I wasn't privy to it because I was in I was in the army. I was uh, I spent most of nineteen sixty eight in Fort Bragg, and I was more worried more about uh, training and deployment from there than I was about what the what the uh, college students were doing. Uh, I guess yeah. most of them were college right, students. Right, right, right. And, uh, but I didn't really notice that too much when I left, uh, but there was some. Okay, yeah. So, uh, flew, uh, take the, your route to, to, to Went to Fort Ord, California to deploy from there. Uh, flew World Airlines, uh, chartered. They, they had, uh, uh, at that point in the war, we were mostly replacements. Uh, my original group went over by ship in 1966, late 19, I think they arrived in Vung Tau in uh, December of 1966. Uh, but most of us at this time were uh, replacements for various units. So we flew over there, we landed in, uh, took us 11 and a half hours to get to Kyoto, Japan, where we refueled. and. Uh, we lost something like 18 hours in that flight, so it was like a day and a half after I left. Uh, then we flew from there to uh, Tonsonut Air, Air Base or Airport and uh, took a, a bus from there to the 90th Replacement Battalion. What, what's that like? I mean, particularly that last leg of the flight when you've got all these hours, really nothing to do but to think. I mean, you're wondering what you're flying into. I mean, you remember. Anything going through your mind? I mean, well, I'm sure there was a lot of apprehension, but you know, we're young, and it's, in a way, it's an adventure. Uh, I don't think anybody, until they get into a situation, uh, knows how yeah. severe it can be. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. You just don't know. Right, right. And what about I was here when you first walk out that door out of the airplane? What, oh, uh, yeah, uh, you've heard this is, before, haven't you? Uh, the heat, the heat is an enormous. They open that door and, and the whole airplane floods with heat. Uh, it's like an oven. It's just really hot. Oh, but, uh, you know, you adjust to it. It doesn't take too long. You know, it was here too, as you walk down, uh, another thing that hits is the smell. Yeah, there are a lot of odors in, in Vietnam, but uh, I, I didn't notice an odor right away. Uh, at least I don't remember one. Okay, all right. So you went to the uh, repo depot and then right, the, Repo Depot. And then went, uh, was a sign. Then uh, how long were you there before you went off to? I think it was close to a week, uh, 90th Replacement Battalion. And and uh, I think we did, I remember they had a, they came in one night, we had bunk beds. And we were on a wooden platform uh, floor with a tent over us. And they came in one night as we were hitting the sack and they said, uh, there's going to be a B-52 strike tonight, but it's over a mile away. So don't uh, don't worry about it but you'll hear it. Well, it was so loud in the middle of the night, the guy above me in the bunk above me jumped out of bed and broke his toe. <laughs> oh, man. So it was, uh, it was loud. Wow. wow. And it was a mile away. So but you were, uh, I mean, the uh, enemy was right outside your gate then, pretty much, if, it, if there was a strike. Yeah, yeah, I don't know where the 90th is, the 90th replacement battalion is, uh, but it can't be too far from uh, a long bend, which is where our our base camp was, our brigade main base. Uh, after about a week, uh, they, they would call out names every day as they needed replacements. And uh, the unit that uh, needed me, I guess, was the uh, was Alpha Company. Alpha Company uh, 
3rd Battalion, 7th Infantry Regiment, 199th Light Infantry Brigade. And uh, they weren't far away, so we just took a deuce and a half trucks and drove over there, and we were, it wasn't too long, so they couldn't have been too far from there. And I know uh, the BMB for my unit was uh, right on the edge. I mean, we had a, a, a Vietnamese village right across the road from us. But uh, there's security, uh, so it, it, it's not too dangerous in that area. But uh, they had been attacked uh, in uh, Tet in 1968. They'd had uh, uh, quite a bit of an, an attack. Well, uh, you know, you say there's security and, and, and such, but, I mean, it, to me, you, know, you, you had an entirely different war than, say, World War II, where you knew, you know, 10 clicks up the road, that was the front line. There was really no front line. I mean, it, could you ever let your... Uh, your guard down I mean with that village I mean you didn't know if that was friend or foe. You could although at this stage when I'm when I'm first there of course I'm nervous and apprehensive and I, I don't think that way but as time goes by yes you can let your guard down in that area because uh, uh, although there's no place safe in Vietnam there are places that are much safer than others. <laughs> I was to find that out. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. So and, and the rear area there is a rear area uh, but that doesn't mean it can't be breached. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get in, uh, take your story now, you're into your new unit. And, uh, right, I, I uh, arrived at Alpha Company and uh, uh, asked the ex executive officer as I walked in the door if, if uh, it was a good unit. I want, you know, again, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm going, uh, can you tell me honestly where I'm at? And he says, uh, yeah, this is a good unit. We, we, uh, we do good work. We're, we're, uh, we're as cautious as we can be uh, with what we have to do, uh, but we had a bad day today. We lost a couple of guys or something, and so I, I just, I don't need to hear anymore. <laughs> so, but it, uh, they weren't too far away. Their main objective, uh, the 199th, they were also called the Red Catchers. Uh, they were stationed in the areas around Saigon uh, for defensive positions, and uh, they trucked me through Saigon to uh, Firebase Stephanie, which was about five miles south of Saigon. And it was a small firebase. It had uh, culverts that we would sleep in uh, with sandbags around the ends. And they had some 105 howitzers. And uh, what we would do from there is pull ambushes. Uh, to get to the ambush sites, we would usually take trucks down the road and they would let us out and we would walk in on rice paddy dikes and uh, uh, spend the night. Uh, our, our ambushes were, uh, were nighttime ambushes. We would, uh, we would find a place to uh, spring an ambush and then we, what we would do is get a couple hundred meters from there and then wait till it was just dark enough that nobody could see us move into that spot. And then we would move in and uh, lie down we still wouldn't all be awake I mean we would sleep through the night except for two or three of us and uh, if anybody saw any anybody they would wake us up and we would spring an ambush and we used uh, starlight scopes we had those big clunky starlight scopes that uh, uh, we could see at night with and they were handy to have in, in the Delta uh, later on I would move into the jungle and we didn't use those because it was uh, it was a different animal Wow. Wow. Well, you're sitting here describing the Delta and jungle. I mean, here's this Nebraska boy yeah. halfway around the world. And it, it just must have been like a foreign country. Uh, well, it was a foreign country, but just a foreign environment. I mean, I just uh, going from the, the, the plains to, to the jungles of Southeast Asia. It had its heat and humidity it, in yeah. like Nebraska, but it was a little more, more so, a little more, uh, a little, a little more heat and a little more humidity. But uh, all in all, it wasn't too bad. There was a lot of, now here we get into the odors, when we were walking in those uh, rice paddies, uh, we would, I mean, there was a lot of uh, muck, what we'd call muck. Uh, I mean, you could actually pull your boot off walking in some of that stuff, even though they're laced up. Uh, really uh, tough terrain, even though it's open. There was a lot of what we called nipa palm, and I always wondered if nipa palm was an actual palm tree or if it was an actual word, because that's just what we called it. And I looked it up once, and it is. It's a, a palm tree where most of the trunk is, is underground, hmm. and just the, the top branches are above ground. Hmm. But a uh, lot of nip of palm, and uh, sometimes uh, sometimes they, the enemy would be in the nip of palm, so you wouldn't see them, and you'd be out in the open. Uh, sometimes they would have uh, 
uh, a lot of booby traps in the south and, uh, on the dikes and stuff, but they would a lot of times label their booby traps. The word for booby trap is tudia, the Vietnamese word, and you would see a sign that says tudia. So you would. Another thing we had going for us is we had uh, we used what they called chu hoys. Our platoon had a chu hoy. I think his name was Tao, T A O, and he was a former enemy who had either been captured or had surrendered and gone over to our side. So he's on our side, and he would walk point almost all the time out there. And uh, when we had him, and and he would oftentimes uh, point out booby traps to us so we could avoid them. Oh, so he was nice to have. Wow. 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 How often would you go out on, on missions? We would like... be out almost all the time. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah now, they wouldn't always be... Uh, long we might actually go out one night and then come back the next day to our base camp our fire base uh, but then we'd probably go out the next night too uh, sometimes we would stay out and uh, i don't know two or three days maybe a week uh, not usually very long though usually we'd come back because they're using trucks so they they didn't hesitate to bring us back now we didn't always take trucks sometimes we'd take uh uh, APCs, sometimes we just walk out. APCs are armored personnel carriers. They're like a tank without a turret. Is a turret or word? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the APCs were fun to ride on because you felt kind of invisible. invincible. Uh, but I've talked to APC guys and they said, no, you're not. Uh, then occasionally the Navy would pick us up uh, mm. on, on what we called rag boats. And uh, Rag boats, they had a, a, like a drop gate, a tailgate, and they would drop that down on the bank, and you could get a platoon of guys in there, and then they'd pull that up, and they'd uh, drive down river and uh, let you out on a bank. I remember, uh, uh, I remember one night we took rag boats, or one day we took rag boats, and they let us out, and we walked in a couple hundred meters on a rice paddy, and then we waited till it got almost dark. We were going to go a little bit further, and we drove, and we walked. Uh, I was walking second. I had a platoon sergeant named Sergeant Horn. He was walking first, and he had a uh, M14, and uh, with a, I think he had a scope on it. He was like a sniper, and he carried that thing over his shoulders, which is idiotic to yeah, do. But right. he he walked down that dike, and uh, we came to a right angle, so we turned left and started left. Well, it's dark. So that our people behind us uh, that uh, spread out quite a ways, they couldn't see that we'd turned left. Well, we get about 20 feet and a, a Viet Cong pops up right in front of uh, Sergeant Horn and starts running away from him. Well, he couldn't get that rifle off his shoulder, but he has a 45 on his hip and he pulls that 45 out and shoots the guy. And that flash and that sound was different to all of our guys back here. Oh, so they open up right at that flash. And I turn to the left and I see all these red tracers coming right at us. And fortunately, all our guys are bad shots, so they were all high. But we rolled off We rolled off the dike into the water when we saw that. And uh, that was a close call for us. But I popped a flare and uh, they realized what they'd done, so they, they, they stopped shooting. Oh, man. How, how was it? I mean, you know, I'll go out camping for a weekend and come back and be exhausted from being out and about. I mean, you guys are, I, 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 I look at your situation, you said you go out three or four, sometimes a week at a time. Yeah, I imagine you're not getting the right amount of sleep. I don't know. Your uh, hygiene probably isn't so good. You're eating probably marginally. You're out in the elements, exposed. I mean, to me, any one of those conditions would knock a man down, but you, know, you got them all combined with the stress of war. How, how do you think you function through that, that time period? Well, I, I think at that uh, the youthful age, I, I was only uh, 20. I turned 21 in a foxhole over there. So 21 is a, a tough age. I mean, I think uh, those guys could do anything. Uh, but they did. They got tired. We got tired. Uh, there were times we were hungry. There were times we didn't have enough sleep. Uh, a lot of times we didn't have enough sleep. Uh, but you persevere. You, I mean, that's what you do. I mean, you, you have to. 
I mean, if you have to do something, it's a little easier to do. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah. And, and how was it? I mean, uh, once again, you're, I, I'm comparing your wars to other wars, but uh, in World War II, you know, everybody went over as a unit, and you guys were going individually as replacements. Did you integrate with the guy? I mean, did you? How how was that uh, getting? Good question. And we did. It took a while sometimes. Um, it's certainly not a popularity contest. So if you have somebody that's in your squad, and, I mean, you rely on him. So, and, and you sleep together, you eat together, uh, you do everything together. So uh, whether you like the person or not, you usually like him enough to survive with him. Wow. So there were there were very few people over there that I didn't like. Most of them I did. Okay. Most of them were good friends. Wow. Yeah. And I still maintain contact yeah. with some of them. Yeah. Now yeah. after uh, after Firebase Stephanie, I was only at Stephanie for a month or so, and then we moved further south to uh, a little town called Kanjuk, and we had a firebase there called Madeline. And Madeline was uh, uh, the rainy season hit us down there, and mm. it was. Uh, uh, very muddy, even within our base camp, a lot of mud. And uh, we would walk around while we were back. Now, this is not the rear area, but it still feels safer than uh, than being out. And uh, we would walk around in just uh, our olive drab boxer shorts and uh, flip-flops. I mean, that's oh, about really? all we wore most of the time when we were in there. Uh, spent a lot of time on top of our bunkers playing cards and, and cleaning weapons and that type of thing. Uh, so we got some downtime, even even in the fire base. Uh, the first night we were there, we got mortared. And uh, talk about not having enough sleep. I remember that night. We, that was the first night we moved into uh, Madeline. And uh, we had some metal buildings that we put our, our bunkers in, our, our, uh, our gear. And uh, the metal buildings didn't have sandbags. But the inside, we had culverts inside that had sandbags around them. And that's where we'd either sleep in there or on top of them, depending on uh, how hot it was, I guess. Oh, but uh, we had, uh, we had this night, we, I was sleeping, and I don't know if it was in the middle of the night or just late, but uh, mortars started coming in. And I remember a few explosions, and I remember people running over me and diving into a bunker. But I just laid there and slept because I was so tired. In the morning, I woke up and that metal, the metal side of that building was just sh shredded with holes. <laughs> so when you need sleep, you're going to get it. <laughs> I guess so. Wow, wow. What would you uh, uh, would you guys ever get pulled back for uh, in country R and R? And did you go on, did you have an out of country R and R? Yeah, some of us got in country R and Rs. I never did. Uh, There's a, a Vung Tao was an in country R and R site. I never got to that, but I did uh, manage to get two R and Rs in, which is which is better than a lot of guys. Uh, my first one was to Hong Kong. I'd been, oh. I think I had to be in country like five months or so before you applied for an R and R, and I wanted to see something that was totally different. Uh, I wasn't married at the time. A lot of married guys would go to Hawaii and meet their wives, mm -hmm. but uh, I wanted something totally different. Uh, so I went to Hong Kong and had a great seven days. I ate steak every night and. Uh, uh, had Chianti every night and uh, uh, just had a wonderful time. It was a neat city. I really liked it. I bought some uh, electronic gear, which they're famous for. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I got back, I spent uh, maybe another two months or so in country. And uh, somebody asked me if I'd had R&R, &R, and I said, yeah, I already had it. And they said, well, ask again. I mean, there's no law against asking. What are they going to do, say no? <laughs> yeah. So I did, and they said, sure. So I went to Sydney, Australia. Oh, excellent. And that was fun, too. That's a beautiful country. Yeah, yeah. Nice yeah. people. Mm -hmm. They really, at that time, I don't know how they are now, but at that time, uh, they really loved Americans. Mm -hmm. They were very, uh, very uh, nice to us and uh, uh, just a beautiful, beautiful city. I spent it all on Sydney, on the beach, most of it. It w was it tough um, going really into civilization and having to come back to your your conditions? I mean, well, yeah, it was. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't like leaving home. Yeah, you know, yeah. when you when you left home, it was so tough. But leaving R and R, you just knew your time was up, so you had to go back. And uh, you spent. Uh, I remember we had 
Well, after Tanjuk, after uh, Firebase Madeline, uh, we moved north uh, to Swan Luck, and this was all jungle terrain up there. In between those two, that move, though, we had had one experience in the jungle where our, where our uh, platoon sergeant came and said, uh, "We're going to go uh, north. We're going to go north a little ways." And uh, actually, where we ended up was Kuchi, but he didn't tell us that. Uh, I've just I just read about it afterwards. But uh, we're going to go to uh, north. It's going to be a little different terrain. You guys are going to have to be on your toes to do well up here. This is a little more dangerous than where we're at now. So. Uh, we were uh, we were anticipating a little bit, and uh, when we got there, we spent a week in foxholes that the Australians had dug, <laughs> and uh, just sat there waiting. Uh, I don't know, just didn't do anything. I re I remember one night I got bit in the leg. I, I was in the, I was on guard duty, and uh, I was the only one awake that I know of, and I couldn't see anything. I mean, it's just black. Yeah, I hear that, yeah. And uh, my legs were dangling in the foxhole, I was sitting on the edge of it, and something stung me on the leg, and I grabbed my pant leg and squeezed it, and I didn't know what to do, I didn't want to let go of it in case it was still alive, I didn't know what it was, so I, the guy next to me was from Minnesota, his name was Larry Finky, real nice guy, and I said, hey Larry, I woke him up, and he, and he was really groggy, and I said, Larry, finally, he, he said, what do you want, and I said, give me your knife, I knew he had a knife, and I didn't. And he says, no. <laughs> so I said, I need your knife. I think he thought I was going to kill myself. Oh. So he said, no, no. So I, I finally just stood up, and I held my pant leg out as far as I could, and then I just shook it real hard. And, and I couldn't tell what it was because it was dark. So, But I, I'll always remember that. And it hurt. But right it never, calf. It never it, got... Uh, Nothing came of it. I mean, it, no. Oh, okay. No, yeah. no. Oh, and then, uh, <laughs> anyway, we eventually got ready to move out for this. Uh, and uh, the day they said, "Let's go," uh, we started getting our gear ready. They came to us and said, uh, "Hey, uh, if anybody wants to do communion, there's a priest over here." Nobody had ever done that before, so <sighs> I'm thinking, "Oh, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not that religious. I, I just get my gear together and get my rucksack on." And as I start walking out. I look over and I see the priest and I see two guys on their knees taking communion. Uh, one was Ronnie, uh, both of them were named Ronnie, Ronnie Ward and Ronnie Brashears from Kansas. And uh, uh, about a half hour later, uh, one of them would step on a booby trap and uh, the other one was right behind him and he w they would both die and I was right behind them and I would spend three weeks in the hospital from that. And that's where you got but your... I saw those two guys, and I always, yeah. I always remember that too. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So that's the day you, you were wounded. And that was, your, that was your, the your, first time. The first time. Okay. Yeah. Oh man. How how bad how badly were you wounded? It wasn't bad compared to the rest of them. When uh, it was a Claymore mine, and man, that thing it knocked a lot of people down. But only three of us were really bleeding, and uh, uh, one of them was pretty much gone instantly. They brought him back and he survived for about nine hours. The other one uh, had lost, uh, the one that stepped on it had lost both his legs and uh, he survived for about nine days. But I didn't know he'd passed. Uh, I know that uh, the one that, uh, when they brought the first one back, uh, my platoon sergeant uh, had called in for a medevac already I just came to, I must have been out for just a second because I remember laying, I remember opening my eyes and seeing grass blowing in front of me and blue sky and then I could smell the cordite and it was interesting. I mean, it was very peaceful at first really? until you start hearing the screams and the yells. And then, uh, then uh, I, I heard, I didn't hear him call for a medevac. But then I heard him talking to it. There was a light observation helicopter above us, uh, probably a colonel or something in, uh, observing, and uh, uh, maybe a battalion commander, I don't know. And he says, we need a medevac, and uh, we need your helicopter down here. And they radio back to him, there, there's a medevac on the way. And he says, bring that helicopter down here now or I'm going to shoot it out of the air. That's what he said to him. And that helicopter dropped like a rock, and they put the worst. They put Ron, the first uh, one who had already 
he seemed like he was already gone. They put him on that helicopter and took off. And then uh, the other one, the other Ronnie, uh, uh, rode in the helicopter with me. And I just, I wasn't that bad. I, uh, I had, uh, I was three weeks in the hospital, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it really wasn't that bad for me compared to them. Hmm. And uh, uh, it was, that was tough. That was a tough helicopter ride because I, I kept telling him he'd be all right. He was semi-conscious. I don't think he could really understand me. But uh, it was tough. Oh, man. Wow. How, how was that? I mean, that's another thing. Uh, here's a person that's never been in anywhere remotely close to combat and, uh, and violence and stuff and, and really not exposed to violent death. I mean, how, how does one deal with that? I, uh, just. Well, I think at first, you, you know, I don't know, maybe this is a wrong thing to say, but at first you're happy you're alive. Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, that's a normal feeling, I guess. Uh, I didn't stay conscious too long because I, when I got to the uh, hospital, uh, I'd already had some morphine or something, and it made you sleepy. So mm -hmm. I kind of uh, dozed off, and when I woke up, I'd already been operated on. And... Uh, then I had uh, I had a general, uh, General Davison, uh, first black general to command a unit. Nice guy. He came in to give me a Purple Heart, and uh, I I tried to get out of bed and they, oh no no don't get. I so I laid there in bed and he gave me a Purple Heart and he said, "Is there anything I can do for you?" Well, I said, "Well yeah," <laughs> and I could see his aide's eyes go oh. <laughs> no, <laughs> but I said yes, sir. I said uh, I don't. I don't have all my gear was left out in the field. I don't have any of my stuff. I had it all on my back, and I got on a helicopter without it. Where's that at? And also, how are the two other guys? I, nobody tells me anything. So he said we'll find out for you. And of course, he is too busy to do that. So yeah. I yeah. never knew. But uh, I, I, when I got back to my unit after three weeks. Uh, they t they told me uh, the other one had died too, and I I didn't know that, so I, I that so I had the same feeling again. Right, you know? right, right. But I spent uh, three different hospitals, uh, including Cameron Bay, where they had a boxing ring set up on the beach for people for patients to box with each other. <laughs> so I didn't do that. Yeah, right, 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 right. How was it? Uh, I imagine your mom got got word back home uh, yeah how, they how give you a slip when you join the or when you go to Vietnam do you want your relatives informed if you're hurt and I probably should have said no but I said yes because and I'm close to my mom so yeah uh, yeah they sent uh, telegrams but they say uh, not seriously oh, okay. Oh, okay, good. that's what the, the wording was so good good so three weeks in the hospital and then you return back to your unit huh? right then I return back to uh, to uh, Madeline, Firebase Madeline, and uh, most of those guys were uh, a little surprised that I'd come back. They thought maybe I'd gone to Japan or back to the States. They, they thought my hand was uh, gone, but it really wasn't that bad. Hmm. So uh, after a while, we left Madeline and went north to Swan Luck, which is about 45 miles north of Saigon, and this is jungle terrain. Now, here we would change uh, tactics. Our tactics, uh, first of all, everywhere we went for ambushes was by helicopter. We, we didn't take trucks anymore, uh, no river, uh, no walk. Well, we would walk, but after we got out of the helicopters. Uh, so helicopters would take us in, and because it's helicopters and it's more expensive to operate a helicopter, we would stay out longer. So here we would go anywhere from three days to three weeks. Uh, as, as I remember it, I could be a little off on that, but uh, uh, the operations were in the jungle, so our, our, uh, our ambushes would switch from nighttime to daytime. Hmm. We would, at night, we would just form a little perimeter and tighten up and, and try to stay hidden. Uh, we would still be on guard and we would put out claymore mines for protection and that type of thing, but we wouldn't. Uh, we wouldn't really uh, pull anything at night if we could help it. And then uh, during the day when we're traveling, like they would, uh, they would give us orders to move uh, northwest or something, uh, so many clicks, and 
when we do that, if we came across a path in the jungle, if any path at all, practically, we would stop and fall back a little bit and then put four or five guys out there to pull a, an ambush. And you would just sit on that path and wait. If it was a big path, you wouldn't have to wait more than a half hour, 45 minutes before somebody would come walking down. Hmm. Wow. And uh, that's, that's basically all we did. We'd move, 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 and uh, walk a lot. And we had uh, rucksacks on us with... Uh, uh, usually they would give us a, a day, uh, how many days you're going to be out, and if uh, or how many days till resupply. And sometimes they would resupply us while we're out there. Uh, one one time uh, they said, uh, I remember they said take uh, supplies for three days. So we'd take uh, nine boxes of sea rations. We'd open those up and put them in our socks in time so they wouldn't make any noise, and so we'd have dry socks when we finished our meals. <laughs> And uh, so we'd have those in our rucksacks, and we'd have uh, uh, two or three bandoliers of M16 ammo, and we'd have uh, uh, a couple belts of uh, M60 ammo, machine gun ammo, and uh, uh, some grenades, some uh, smoke grenades, some uh, various things like uh, laws, M72 light anti-tank weapons, uh, and... Uh, personal gear, any personal gear you took. And we would uh, walk for, we, we, they told us, go for three, you're going for three days. So we packed those nine, uh, nine seats. Well, six days later, we still hadn't been resupplied. And they dropped a case of batteries out of a helicopter to resupply us. We didn't know they were batteries. And it wedged in a palm tree and we had to hack it out of there with machetes. It took us about 45 minutes. We get that out and open it up and it's That's batteries bad. that we didn't need. So uh, I don't know how much longer we went without supply, but uh, they did finally resupply us. And, wow! But we were—that was a day we were hungry. And that was a—that was a few days we were really hungry. Wow! How, how many normally in a group would go out that when you'd go out? Usually we uh, we would work in platoon size strength, which is uh, supposedly 42, 42 men, and uh, I don't think we ever had forty-two in a platoon. We'd usually have thirty something. Uh, they were always a little under staffed and uh, but usually platoon size operations and then uh, uh, towards the end really the, the only battle I was ever in uh, I mean we had we had instances where we'd have a firefight but you wouldn't really call that the the Viet Cong would hit and take off so you would have a firefight uh, but it would be over fairly quickly uh, but we got into it with the NVA uh, tw towards the end of my tour in fact the last day I was in the jungle I, w I was uh, taken out by a helicopter from for wounds but uh, we in the end of February 1970 we were walking and we had two platoons plus a command post and then we had another platoon that was off to the side somewhere for uh, reinforcements if we needed them and we were looking for bunkers that we knew were out there and the feeling was uh, the feeling was very tense. It was different than any other time during the year. And we found the bunkers on the last day of February, but it was late in the day. So we we said, hey, let's pull back and let artillery come in here. And we did that. We we went back. I don't know half a click, I guess, or maybe maybe even further than that. Uh, during the year, you become uh, and you're sleeping in the jungle. We didn't make noise in the jungle. We were very quiet. And during that time, you would develop the ability to wake up just to roll over. I, I did that. Every time I moved in my sleep, I'd wake up first. And uh, I think everybody did that uh, because you just didn't want to make noise. And uh, during that night, I'm listening for artillery, and I only heard one round. Now, my... My, my captain, who's a friend of mine, says, no, that's not true. There was a lot more than that going. But he wasn't, I don't, he wasn't there at the time, but he'd talked to the forward observer. So at any rate, we, uh, we went back in the morning and uh, we went in wrong. We, uh, we went in the same way we'd come out and uh, they were waiting for us. And they hit us, uh, I don't know, seven in the morning and we fought with them till about four in the afternoon. Oh, we had, uh, that day we had 32, I, now 
this is a guesstimate, but 32 guys in our platoon, 16 of them were dusted off. Oh, and we lost two. We lost my lieutenant, Terry Bull, who was from Littleton, Colorado, right here in the, up in the Denver area. Uh, nice guy. Nicest lieutenant I had over there. And he was fairly new. Uh, he, he was uh, killed almost right away, uh, instantly. And uh, we had, I was walking, when we walked into that, I was like seventh back from the front. And my lieutenant was in front of me, well, not directly in front of me, but somewhere up, in one of the seven up front, or six up front. And uh, when we got close, uh, there was a guy named Mike Camrat in front of me, who was a good friend of mine. He was from the Chicago area, and uh, really talented guy. And I, uh, I smelled him. I could smell him. Hmm. And uh, I touched him on the shoulder, and we're walking real quiet. And uh, he turns around to see what I want, and I point to my nose, and he's, he nodded because he could smell him too. And uh, we came to a boulder uh, that was probably about four or five feet high, and uh, Mike had just climbed on top of it and was moving, and I climbed up on top of it, but I hadn't raised my head to look where Mike was at yet when the first shots rang out. And it was automatic fire, but it was just that quick and it was done and of course when when there's firing like that uh, you're gonna duck so I turned around and dropped to the back of that boulder and my rucksack came off me real quick and I'm all ready to go because it was perfect for me I'm well hidden yeah and uh, after a pause uh, then it just breaks loose there's bullets everywhere there's noise everywhere oh, uh, I turned to uh, I turned to uh, my friend John, John Napolitan from Massachusetts, laying on the ground, looking out, and he's behind a log on the ground. And uh, I shouted something to him, but he didn't answer me. He was, he was getting splinters in his lips uh, from the bullets hitting the log in front of him. And uh, then it died down, and as soon as it died down enough for people to hear me, I realized those, seven, uh, those six guys are out there, and I don't know where they're at, so they're kind of... They're kind of separated. They're, uh, at, as it turned out, they were pinned down at this point. Mm -hmm. They took probably the brunt of the fire, although the fire went all the way back. It got uh, the, uh, the platoon sergeant in the second platoon back there was wounded. He was walking behind or in front of a radio, and they picked the guys that were walking in front of the radios, and he was shot in the shoulder. So they were all along us, and uh, I turned and I... I realize those six guys are out there and we've got to reconnect and we got to do it quickly. So I said, uh, uh, I look, there's no radio, no, no officer, uh, no uh, medic. So I said, I need you to pass the word back that we need a medic up here, we need an officer, and we need a radio. And then I need some M16s to follow me. And I turned around and climbed that boulder again. Didn't look back. It's just like leaving home. I didn't look back because I was afraid nobody would be there. So. I climbed that boulder and I took a few steps out to the middle of it and I and I saw off to my left was Mike Camrat and he's standing there and he and I start to take a, a step towards him and there's an explosion right between the two of us uh, closer to him and he's down so I start running for him and and realize there's a guy right next to me that had followed me so there's two of us up there and uh, we grabbed him together and picked him up and he's still alive he's fine he looks good except he's all bloody I mean he's still he's still coherent yeah so I grabbed one arm and the other guy grabbed his other arm and we start carrying him back to the behind that boulder and uh, and uh, I I dropped my my steel pot came off my hat so I I let him take him the last few steps and I grabbed my steel pot put it on my head Boy, you can visualize this stuff. I mean, it's just like still there. Wow, wow. I put that steel pot on my head and turned and fired into the bushes on the right side and then jumped back behind the boulder. And that was probably about 7, 15, 7, 10, 7, 05, I don't know, somewhere in there. Yeah. I didn't carry a watch. Yeah. But it was early in the morning. 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm, I'm uh, or 3.34, I'm looking over. I'm laying down prone, facing outwards. And every once in a while we'll take fire, but it's not uh, full blown. And I'll, I looked over to that boulder, and I had a friend named, uh, well, I, he was a skinny little red-haired kid from, uh, actually originally from California. His name was Phil 
Salwa, he pronounces it as French. I called him Salois because I didn't know it was French. <laughs> so Phil Salois or Salwa, he's over there next to this boulder. And uh, one of my squad members, uh, Herb Klug, is over there with him. And the two of them are talking. And it's, I thought it was weird that they were just sitting there talking to each other. Well, Phil had decided, uh, and I'm not real religious, but he had prayed. He prayed to God, and he said, I'm going to do something crazy here. I'm going to go out and get those guys. And if you help me get through this, I'll do whatever you want. Honest truth. you, you got to go interview Phil. So he started to go, and Herb stopped him and said, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing? And Phil told him, and he says, well, I'll go with you, but we got to have a plan. So they devised a plan where one of them would lay down fire while the other one moves. And I, and I just turned back to my front because uh, I didn't know what they were talking about. And about, oh, maybe a few minutes later, I can hear the, intent, the, shot, the shooting intensifies. But it's all out front. And it's, uh, Phil carried that M79 grenade launcher. And it's a breach thing. You get one shot. And it, it's a thump, we called it a thumper. And, and I heard that going off with, a, with an amazing frequency. He's got to reload every time. <laughs> uh, right. going, How's he doing that? I said, that's, I turned over and I saw that they weren't, they weren't there. Uh -huh. I, said, I told somebody next to me, I said, that's the lowest out there. I was amazed. And uh, uh, he came back, or well, pretty soon, the guys that were pinned down start flying over the rock. All of them but the lieutenant. The lieutenant had been killed. And uh, in the meantime, my pant leg had, had worked its way up above my knee or something, just laying in the grass. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody said, you got a hole in your leg. And I looked down, and the medic came over and looked at it, and he says, you're out of here on the next helicopter. And I said, uh, all right. And I, I, I wasn't hurt that bad. I probably should have stayed. But, boy, we were, we were all ready to leave at that time. And uh, they... Uh, Actually, I left on the same helicopter my lieutenant left on, so I had a and they did a jungle extraction on me there because they didn't couldn't land a helicopter, so they brought down the extractor and I get <laughs> I get on that and I'm going up and I I'm feeling like I got a big bullseye on. Yeah, no uh, That was kind of scary, but uh, eventually, uh, I, and and then we're hovering up there and they extracted the lieutenant and I rode back with his body. Oh man. And uh, let's see. Herb Klug uh, was killed coming back. Hmm. Were you just running off adrenaline that you just didn't feel your wound or uh, what? Uh... Uh, didn't feel it, but I, I think it was just that minor. Uh, you know, hmm. it left a hole, but it didn't really bleed that much. So hmm. I, I, was, I wasn't too concerned about it, but I was happy to leave. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it was that, and that was getting towards the end of your tour to begin. I mean, I had 30 days left, oh, okay. and I'm still out there in the middle of the jungle. That, uh, that was, uh, I wasn't real happy about that. I was probably more mad that day than I was scared. I, I thought I thought I was going to die. I thought we might all die that day. And I said, uh, you know, this this just, they said if you're going to get hurt, it's going to be at the beginning. Or the That's end. what I've heard, yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I managed to do both. But uh, uh, Herb Klug got the DSC for that. Wow. Actually, it probably could have been both of them because it was Phil's idea, but he was unscratched. He was unscratched, and he's a priest today. Is that right? Wow. Uh, wow. Hmm. So you're evacuated back to the hospital then? Yeah, I went back to uh, the hospital in Sa uh, Saigon. How'd they do that? I don't remember, but I was in the Saigon hospital for a day, and... Uh, they released me after a day, uh, and uh, they had uh, sutured it up, and uh, I left the hospital, and there's nobody there to pick me up, so I, I hitchhiked back to my unit, and uh, oh, and my stitches broke on the way back. So, I, <laughs> and then I spend uh, I spend the next 22 days next to the pool uh, because they didn't they said you don't have to go back out, you you know 11 months and after this stuff, just go ahead and uh, do whatever you want to do. So they had an out, uh, they had an uh, above ground pool there at the BMB uh, back in Long Bend. And so I spent the next 22 days lounging by the pool and, and uh, left with a great tan, but had a hole in my leg when I got home. So. Oh, man. <laughs>
I didn't get it re-stitched. Oh, man. To, to this day, do we either injure uh, wounds give you any trouble? or? Uh, I can feel the shrapnel in my leg, really? but it doesn't give me any trouble, no. And I, can, uh, and I still have a, a ball bearing in my uh, wrist, but it, it doesn't give me any problem. I did have trouble with the ball bearing that was in my palm of my hand, but that was uh, a few weeks after I got out of the hospital. I was, I was pushing myself up on a, on a sandbag or something, and, and it hurt, so I went to the doctor, and he just cut it out, so no big deal. We'll talk about that uh, that day that you you climb on the flight to come home. I hear that's uh, pretty yeah, amazing too. Pretty pretty amazing. Of course, they do their inspections and stuff. And I had a pretty good mustache growing over there. <laughs> and the, and the, and some kid that had probably never been in the jungle said, uh, "You're gonna have to cut that mustache off, or you're not getting on the plane." And he's lucky he's still alive. But, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I did. I didn't care. I shaved and uh, got on that plane and. We were a little apprehensive still until we got over the water, and then we were fine. And uh, flew back into uh, San Francisco or Oakland, somewhere in California. And, and uh, you know, you hear a lot of negative stories about coming home. Uh, I didn't have any. Uh, I didn't have any bad things happen to me, but there wasn't any good things either. It was just like nobody, yeah, nobody there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, got out of my. Uh, they recommended we get out of our uniform and put on civilian clothes and fly back. I threw, I flew through Kansas City where it was uh, pretty cold. Uh, let's see, it was, this was Mar the end of March, but it was still pretty cold in Kansas City. And then flew back to uh, Lincoln from there and, uh, and met my, uh, uh, my girlfriend at that time. She was my, my wife. At, uh, I married her eventually, but it didn't last. But we have uh, two great kids from it, a, a boy and a girl. And uh, my mother was there, and uh, I think my brother was there too. To meet. How was it? You know, I, I'm sorry, I keep going back and comparing it, uh, but uh, the, the previous wars, a lot of people took ships home. They had kind of six weeks to kind, kind of decompress. I mean, literally, 24 hours later, you went from that situation, you're back in yeah, civilization, yeah. society. I mean, it had to be somewhat of a it, it, it was, it was. I think uh, some of that was uh, mellowed out by the fact that I saw people I cared about again. Uh, and, and they did care about me, uh, but they didn't. You know, I, I, asked my, uh, I asked one of my parents before they passed that I said, uh, why didn't you ever talk to me about Vietnam? And she said, uh, this was my stepmother, she said, we didn't know what to say. Mm. So they, they never talked to me about it, really. Um, it was just like you're home now. Yeah. Uh, get a job, go back to work. Uh, if you want to go to school, go to school. And it was difficult. It, you don't really think of it at the time. You, I mean, I didn't recognize what was going on in my mind, but that is very difficult. Yeah. You're you're carrying an a, a, an M16 with uh, live rounds in it one day, and then just a few weeks later. Uh, you're expected to behave civilly. Right, right, right. And so, so it's a little weird, but uh, nothing you can't handle if you just uh, put your mind to it. I mean, some people did better than others. Yeah. Wow. And how was I? I guess when we were back in, in country, uh, were you guys aware of the divide here in the states? And if so, did that did that play on your psyche at all? Or? Yeah, it did. Uh, we we uh, became more cognizant of the uh, of the uh, protest culture, the hippie culture, uh, and it's, to this day, it still confuses me because they're trying to do something that's good for me, but mm. the the dislike I had for them mm -hmm. is there, okay. and, and yeah. that confuses me, oh, it yeah. clashes, oh, uh, and I, it still does to this day. Yeah. You know, I'm smart enough to know that they didn't have something bad uh, in mind. Uh, they wanted to help me. They wanted to bring me home. But, uh, you know, our job was to do what we're told by our government, and uh, that's what we signed up to do. And uh, what they were saying irritated us. Yeah, yeah. For the most part. Sure. I think most of the guys were that way. Uh, you know, there could, there could have been differences. We're all different. Yeah, right, right, right. So you're back home in Nebraska now, uh, trying to sort things out. Where did uh, 
you take some time off or what what uh, take a little time off and then uh, uh, my future wife uh, got a job out here in Jefferson County as a teacher so I followed her out and we lived uh, in uh, Littleton for a, a short time I tried to find uh, I tried to find Terry Bowles my lieutenant uh, his parents oh, right. yeah. uh, as soon as I got to Littleton I realized he was from there and uh, I couldn't find him well they had moved to Texas mm. in the meantime but uh, uh, took 25 years. Well, I, w I went back to work. My brother had written me a letter. Or his wife had written me a letter while I was in Vietnam saying, you know, you can come to work for me if you don't want to go back to college. And uh, I did both. I, I got a job with him. He owned a pet store. So I worked for him and I went to school. Uh, eventually, he said, you're going to have to do one or the other. So I uh, left school and worked for him full time for three years. And then he helped me open my own pet store and I had that 35 years in fact uh -huh. I, I grew to four pet stores really uh, wow. 35 years and and it was a good uh, it was a good job I loved it I loved uh, I loved the people I loved the the customers and the animals it was a perfect job for me and I, I wish I'd been better at it but I was I did fine I had a good uh, a very lucky career was it uh, an interest you always had or just fell into it with your brother and, no, and I, discovered I you loved animals it? but I didn't I didn't do it for that reason. Yeah. In fact, he warned me of that. He was a good businessman, a mentor. He says, you don't go into business because you, you love something. You go into business to make money. Right, right. And uh, so I entered it as a business, and I did, I did fairly well with it. Uh, of course, I learned to love it, too. Yeah. So I think that's important. I think that's why I was lucky at it. Uh, so I did that for 35 years, but, uh, uh, you know, I... I didn't have much contact. Uh, I had one guy from Vietnam. I, on my way out of the army, I stopped by his house and said, "I want to be best man at my wedding." So he was. So I used a, a, a real good friend, uh, uh, Lanny Unruh from Kansas. He was my best man at my wedding, and then I didn't see anybody. Um, maybe two guys in California on my on my vacation. I took to Alaska. I drove through the California, Southern California. Saw two guys out there and and enjoyed their company. But that was it, just uh, very brief. And then 25 years later, I hadn't really seen or done anything with anybody. And then I read an article in a magazine about this Phil Solois, an interview. Uh, oh, was wow. a magazine. And I looked at that and I said, holy cow. I opened the magazine, there's a picture of my platoon looking back at me. And I said, oh, I got I to gotta write him a letter. So I, I wrote a letter to him. I didn't want to impede on his life. I didn't want to infringe on him. Uh, all I wanted to do was say congratulations and I'm happy. So I wrote a letter that said uh, congratulations, I'm really happy for you. Uh, the article was almost exactly like I remembered it and and signed it Skeeter and then I uh, uh, they didn't have his address in the magazine so I, I sent it to the magazine and said would you please forward this to the guy you interviewed. And about two weeks later, he calls me at my business. I didn't put my phone number in there or anything. He just, I guess he knew it came from Denver, so he looked me up or something. But uh, he called me at my business. I probably talked to him for an hour. I had customers coming in and leaving. <laughs> I didn't help anybody. I was so uh, involved. In, and and after about 45 minutes to an hour, he says, you know, we should get together. And I said, I'd love to see you. And I said, well, let's do. And I said, I know where maybe six guys are. And he says, I probably can find six. Uh, so let's meet. So in 1996 or 95, we met in Dayton, Ohio, at the home of Herb Klug, oh, who, wow. who was killed wow. the day that, uh, with uh, and won the DSC with uh, Phil. And Phil had struggled. Uh, he had always wanted to call Herb's parents, and uh, he always felt uh, like he was responsible for his mm -hmm. death because he, yeah, it was right. his idea to right, go right there. So. Uh, he tried several times, couldn't do it. He finally got he finally got the courage to pick up that phone and and held held on to it until they answered the phone and and uh, they immediately accepted him like their own son. And he had a great relationship with uh, with uh, Ray and Beulah Klug from uh, Dayton, Ohio, and they've eventually passed, but uh, they were great people. And we had our first reunion there. And how emotional was that? Oh. Uh, just a weekend, and we had a barbecue at their house, uh, met Herb's sisters, and just had a great time, and uh, uh, a lot of tears when we left. But we decided, 
this is too good. We can't let this go. Yeah. Let's meet every other year. So for the next six years, maybe, yeah, about six years, we would get a dozen, maybe 14 guys that would meet. Uh, and the next one, I think, was San Juan, or Washington, D.C., we went to the wall. And then the next one was San Juan Capistrano, where uh, my medic lives that had worked on me. And uh, then we found a guy in, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you the state because he was high up in government. And he said, this isn't necessarily legal, but uh, you send me names, I'll send you addresses. <laughs> so we, got, we now have over 400 guys on our roster, and we're still doing this every other year. Now, we don't get 400 yeah, guys there. Yeah. A lot of people say, don't call me back. But, yeah, right. But uh, we have uh, probably 50 to 60 veterans come to every other year for our little reunion wow. that we started, that Phil and I started. So, oh, oh, very cool. It is. Wow. It wow. is. And then... Every other year, the opposite year of that, I go to the 7th Infantry Regiment reunion. You know, the 7th Infantry has been in every major conflict since the War of 1812. And uh, I feel that was actually our home. Now, I didn't really know much about history like that when I was over in Vietnam, but I've learned since that that's a, a pretty neat regiment. They're called the Cotton Balers because they used cotton bales in the War of 1812. <laughs> wow. With Andrew Jackson against the British. Battle of New Orleans. Okay. Wow. There's, there's some history there. Wow. Yeah. How, how was it for you personally up until, well, I guess let me, let me back up and ask, when you got back, uh, did your uh, then girlfriend and, and, and uh, ex-wife and your, and, your, and your friends and family, they, did they see a different uh, person come home? Uh, did, did anybody talk about... Uh, I think so. I remember, uh, I remember my uh, my girlfriend saying that uh, I slept with my eyes half o half open. Mm. I remember her telling me that once. Uh, I didn't I didn't know that, but uh, maybe I was having a bad dream or something. I don't know. Uh, mother, my mom uh, said I still had my sense of humor. She she okay. was happy about that. And my dad, I'd said something, when I came out here to visit my dad in Colorado, I'd said something, I had made a remark that probably wasn't uh, appropriate, and he said, you're, you're not in Vietnam anymore. And boy, that hit me like a brick. Wow. So yeah, I've, I've learned that. I mean, it's good to have parents tell you things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every now and then, it's set you straight. Yeah. And uh, so I've, uh, I remember that, and I try to remember, remind myself of that all the time. Mm. Wow. And, and how was that gap of time from when you got back home to that first reunion. I mean, were you, did you put things away? Did you think about yeah, it? I mean, I, I put mean, things away, didn't think about it at all. And uh, 25 years, I mean, these reunions have kind of opened it up. Uh, not always for the, for the good, okay. not always for the bad. I would, I would take the good with the bad. Uh, I mean, I would take the bad with the good. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact that I see these guys now is, uh, is incredible. Uh, but the memories sometimes aren't always good. Yeah, right, right. You know, and it, it just seems like in the last bunch of years, it really have, we've focused on PTSD. Uh, do, you, do you think you experience Do you have any of that, do you think? Or, I uh, do, yeah, yeah. A little. Yeah. 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 Anything that you've... But it's, you know, probably everybody has that. Yeah. No, I it's, a take... it's a traumatic event. Oh, I mean, yeah. You can't go through a car wreck and not have a little of that, so... You've got to uh, you've got to realize, just try to realize where you're at and and uh, do the best you can at behaving. We, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. Oh, good, good. How how was that uh, that experience back to the wall for the first time? Oh, intense. We got there a couple days early. The first time actually was not with my reunion group. I went before that. I went on the 20th anniversary of uh, Ronnie Ward's death. Uh, the the booby trap, May 23rd, 1969. So I went in 89, and uh, our reunions weren't until 95. But I went in 89, and we went a couple days early, and we stayed in a, in a hotel downtown Washington, D.C. Didn't know anything about uh, the D.C. area. And uh, the, the day of the 23rd, uh, we had a taxi take us and let us off uh, on the, on the uh, green or whatever you call that. And I said, uh, "Where's the, uh, where's the Vietnam Memorial?" And they, well, you got to go that way. Just walk over that hill, and you'll find it. Well, I walked. We walked uh, over the hill, 
and as we reached the top of the hill it started raining and as the Vietnam Memorial came into view in the distance a helicopter flew over oh, and boy I'll tell you what that was that was kind of uh, intense oh, but, uh, yeah certainly worth going to though what a great monument yeah. wow. got a lot of names on there that are friends yeah. I came home from Vietnam the day I came home the day I got home my mother said do you want to go to Larry Knipple's funeral he, li he lived a block away from us and I said, what? He said, well, Larry came home today, too. Oh, man. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I've lived a very sheltered life. I can't, I can't fathom, you know, that kind of stuff. I, just how you, how you deal with that, you know. Uh, hmm. Well, I, I, uh, I appreciate where I'm at. And uh, I, I don't exaggerate because I don't feel I ever need to. Yeah, no, right, yeah. So, yeah. a lot of guys had it tougher than me. At least 58,000 of them. <laughs> yeah, right. Wow. Have you ever been back or any desire to go back to Vietnam? Uh, I have not been back. And I st that's still up in the air as far as whether I'd want to or not. I think I'm getting... Uh, mature enough finally in my old age I'm starting to mature <laughs> and uh, maybe I could make it back there I've got a that uh, best man at my wedding uh, uh, Lanny Unruh from Kansas he's got a friend that has a private jet he's in the oil business out there and, and he goes to Vietnam occasionally and he's he's offered to take uh, my buddy with him and my buddy says maybe we could both hitch a ride so oh, that's a possibility down the, down the line and I understand it's a beautiful country and and the people are very nice. You know, that's something I've heard too. That uh, the 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 uh, soldiers we fought against uh, have more respect for us now than the American people do. That's something I've heard. I yeah, don't know if right. that's true or not. But uh, uh, when people go over there, they say they're they're very kind to them. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. Now that we've had all, all this time, you know, you were in the thick of it, and we've had all this time to analyze it and and look it over. What are your thoughts on the war? I mean, then and now, then compared to now and... It's and still tough. I mean, it's still tough. I, I, I think uh, there's days I, I tell myself we were always right. You know, the, the, the idea was right. Uh, but I'll hear friends say, no, we were not right. And it's, it's still, I don't know, I suppose that question will be argued about for, for generations. Uh, sometime in the future somebody will write a book and say no oh, it's right or it's wrong and they'll believe that and go with it I, I can't answer the question mm -hmm. uh, I that's above my pay grade but but I can tell you I think in my heart I feel we were always right uh, and the, one of the reasons I feel that way is because of the the number of people who were killed after we left and I don't think we lost that war either by the way I think we left them and then took away their finances yeah, right. yeah, for ammunition. Right. So it was, uh, it was really, we lost it for them. Uh, they lost it because of us. But uh, we, never, we never had any problems with what we did. Uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a tough one to answer. Yeah, right, okay. okay. You know, before I went over there, my, one of my grandmothers uh, said, uh, do you think we're right over there? And I said, I don't know. I hope to find that out. And she said, that's probably the best answer I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. So, but I, I guess I didn't find out. Wow, uh, wow. Well, Kent, as we, we start to kind of wind down this interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about or any of the stories that have kind of floated to the top that you wanted to talk about so that ideally we round out, I know we're probably only got the tip of your story, the tip of the iceberg of your story, but ideally round out your story as best we can or do you uh, think we've pretty much covered it all? I think we've really done a pretty good job. I, uh, you know, there's a lot of things I can't remember uh, because there, there were 360 days over there. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I do remember, I wanted to mention uh, Herb Klug again, who, had, who was killed over there. I remember uh, an operation once. He was a good man. He was a, he was a, a nice guy. And he came to me once, I was his squad leader, he came to me once and he said, uh, hey Skeeter, 
we were in the middle of the jungle and we were taking a break and uh, I was sitting on a log eating a sea ration or something. He says, hey Skeeter, come here, I want to show you something. So I got up and I walked over behind a tree with him and uh, he had found a fluorescent pink tree frog, probably about that big, hanging right on the side of the tree. Uh -huh. And I looked at that and I said, wow, that's kind of wild, isn't it? But it, he got the biggest kick out of that. He thought that was really neat. Wow. And it was, I guess. So uh, anyway, that's one of those little things. Yeah, I yeah. don't remember a lot of little things, but there were, we, we caught a snake once, uh, or this one guy caught a snake once, and it was venomous. And he, he, they'd put it in a, or it was non-venomous. He'd put it in a, a mortar tube, uh, uh, not the mortar tube, but the, uh, the uh, carrier for the ammo and uh, it was just a hollow thing and uh, he put caught the snake in there and he's horsing around with it and ended up getting bit and uh, didn't know if it was venomous or not so they dusted him off <laughs> uh, what else can i remember we had a we had a lieutenant that uh, ate food from a garden once and we'd warned him not to do that and uh, he had diarrhea so bad they had to dust him off He'd gone through everybody's toilet paper in the whole platoon. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember a lot of little things, but but I think you've done a great job of asking me questions. Well, the last question I always like to ask, and you really kind of laid it out, but uh, uh, the last question I always like to ask with these interviews: How do you think that experience affected your life, changed your life, played a role in your life, or uh, kind of? shouldn't ask this back part, or was it just simply a chapter in your life that you went through? How, how would you answer How would you answer that? Well, I, I think it uh, was a chapter in my life I went through, but it did influence me. Uh, I think it was a hard enough time to where I can go through hard times here uh, a little easier than mm. the average person. Uh, sometimes when something when something trivial happens that uh, upsets me, uh, I can get much more upset than if something major happens. Mm. Something major happens, it's I'm calm, uh, no problem. At least so far, I, I haven't seen anything that really upsets me. Um, you know, other other than what a lot of people get upset by, but uh, it was an it was definitely an influence. Uh, I don't think it was. I don't think it was, there were a lot of influences in my life. I'm 67 years old, so a lot of things. I, I've had mentors here in Colorado, my brothers, and uh, a lot of people have influenced me as much as that war. But the war, uh, the, the war in the country probably sticks out in my mind more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, I think 1969 would be a, would be a, a very big year in my life if i was to if i was to have to say what year in your yeah, life yeah, do right, you think right. is the most sure uh i don't know not most important but the, uh, the most memorable i'd have to say vietnam wow wow yeah. well i want to thank you for setting that to tell your story today but uh, just as important i want to thank you for your service to our country a shot of me in uh, Firebase Mace, uh, the Vietnamese had come in to offer to make us a book and uh, they took pictures of everybody in our unit and, and put them in a book for us. And that's just a, a high view of some of the buildings at Mace. It was a fairly secure area. This is close to Swan Lock and uh, they had a tower there and I think that's where this picture was taken from. Some of those buildings were like mess halls and some of them were like a little barber shop. And uh, we felt fairly secure here. They'd have a, they had a berm that went around the, uh, a berm, uh, about probably a eight foot berm that went around the whole post with bunkers built into the berm. And uh, you could get uh, rockets occasionally or mortars coming in here, but uh, not very often. For the most part, we were pretty safe here. This is a picture of a 155 howitzer taken from a mortar site. Uh, I just thought it was an interesting way to take a photo. Hmm. Now, did you have a camera over there? Did you? I did. I had uh, probably two cameras. I, I lost one in a canal 
and then uh, I had another one that was stolen, and uh, I think I had a third one. Hmm. This is a photo of a 175. This is also at Mace. That's me that climbed up on top of it. They were on treads, so, but boy, when they fired, they, they would make a lot of noise. You'd, they'd make that whole base camp shake. And that's Signal Mountain in the background. These, these would fire, I, as I understood it, they'd fire 300 rounds and then they'd unscrew the barrel and, and uh, helicopter it over the ocean and put a, uh, throw it away and put a new one on. Wow. This is just a shot of me in the jungle. I had a, a little debt cord wrapped around my, inside my helmet liner there uh, we'd use for explosives. And then uh, I was carrying a M70, M72 uh, law, light anti-tank weapon, so, supposed to be used for bunkers, uh, but uh, you could use it for just about anything, really. And I had, I think I was carrying an M79, yeah, I've got an M79 grenade launcher in my hands there, and a vest on that carried uh, 26 rounds. Hmm. I always liked this picture. Uh, one of my favorites, it's uh, John Napolitan on the right, uh, the smaller guy, and I'm on the left, and uh, we were waiting for extraction. We were waiting for helicopters to come pick us up. It's not a very good picture, but I, I like the smoke in the background. Our lieutenant had thrown out a smoke grenade and set the whole place on fire for the helicopters to see, and and uh, I just like the size difference between us. He was a good friend of mine. Hmm. And this is a photo of our, our reunion group. We get together every other year and uh, sometimes it's uh, 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 sometimes it's more than this, sometimes it's less than this, and sometimes the, the people aren't always the same. Some come early, some go late, and it's just like Vietnam. They come and go uh, at odd times. And, but uh, this was in Portland a few years ago, and uh, we still do this. We still get together every other year with this. This is a company reunion. Hmm.